Hi, Dr. J here, and this is my guide to Bayes' Rule. If you're new to this channel, you might want to go back to the start of the playlist where we talk about mathematical sets. If you're already familiar with mathematical sets, you still might want to go back and watch the video on conditional probability. Because the Bayes' Rule is really just an application of conditional probability. Uh, as usual, down below in the description, there's a link to a PDF version of these slides. Now, Bayes' Rule itself, the name Bayes, comes from a statistician, philosopher, and minister named Thomas Bayes, who lived in the early 1700s and who came up with this formulation. Uh, Bayes' Rule itself, as I mentioned before, is just really an application of conditional probability twice. So here, we're trying to figure out what the probability of A given B is, and if you remember our definition for conditional probability, we can just write what that is. So that's the joint probability for A and B divided by the probability for B. As a reminder here, we always want to write in the denominator here the probability of what's given to the right of the conditioning bar in our conditional probability. And now all we're going to do is we're going to use our definition for conditional probability again. And so here's our using it again. So all we've done is we've changed the numerator, and now we've plugged in our definition for the conditional probability of B given A, but we've rearranged the terms a little bit so that we have solved for the joint probability of A and B, but that turns out to be also equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A. So we put those two conditional probability uh, uses together. This is what we get for Bayes' rule. The probability of A given B is the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. So one way to think about Bayes' rule is that we're trying to switch the conditioning bar. So we started out with the probability of A given B on the left side of the equation, but on the right side of the equation we have the probability of B given A. And so anytime you need to switch the conditioning bar, that's when Bayes' rule is extremely helpful. All right, here's the first example of how to use Bayes' rule, uh, going back to our six-sided die rolling experiments. So what's the probability that the roll is odd if we know that the roll is less than three? That's the calculation that we're trying to do. And it's probably pretty intuitive to you right away that if you know it's less than three, well, there's only two possibilities. It's either a one or a two. And since each one of those has an equal probability of occurring, then the probability of being odd, which is the probability of being one, is just one half. So we already know the answer, so we can check our answer when we're done using Bayes' rule to solve this problem. In order to use Bayes' rule, we need to define some sets. So we'll define here two sets. The first set is the probability that the, or the event uh, that the roll is less than three, that's a one or a two. And the second event is that the roll is odd, which is one, three, and five. And now if we're trying to find the probability of being odd, given that it was less than three, then that's the probability of A given B. All right, and now we'll just use Bayes' rule. So we want the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. And uh, probability of A and B are probably pretty easy, right? What's the probability that it's odd? Well, that's one half. What's the probability that it's less than three? Well, it's one and two uh, out of six possibilities. So that's two sixth or one third. Um, the probability of B given A is a little bit harder to uh, determine, but we did that in our last slide. So if there's a link up here, go ahead and click on that to go back to the last slide. Uh, but what we know is that that, and you probably figured out pretty quickly right here, if you know the roll is odd, What's the probability it was a one or a two? Well, there's only one possibility of being a one or a two and being odd, that's a one, out of three possibilities, so that's one third. So if we plug in those values, we get one third times one half divided by one third. The one thirds cancel, and we get that this probability is one half, which is great because it matches our intuition that we had before. All right, now the denominator here in Bayes' rule, uh, oftentimes we don't know what that probability is and we'll have to find that probability in a more complicated way. In order to do that, we're going to make use of something called the total law of probability. So the total law of probability starts with having a set B that's a subset of our sample space S, and we have a partition A1, A2, on up, a possibly countably infinite partition of that same sample space S. And the total law of probability tells us that if we're trying to calculate a probability for B, that one way to do that is that we can calculate the probability of B and A1 and add that to the probability of B and A2 and add that to the probability of B and A3 and so forth for the entire partition. That's the key. We have to do this for every element or every event in the partition. 
So one way to think about this visually is to go back to our Venn diagrams. In our Venn diagrams, if you recall, the probability when we look at the Venn diagram is just the area of our event as a proportion of the total area for the sample space S. In this case, that sample space is the big outer rectangle. All right, so in this case, we're trying to calculate the probability for B, that is the oval, right? So we're trying to calculate the area that's in that oval. And one way that we can calculate that area is to calculate the pieces of the area of that oval that are in these different rectangles, A1, A2, up through A5. So if we calculate the probability B by calculating the probability B and A1, that's the area in the oval that's orange. Then if we calculate then we want to calculate the probability of B and A2. Well, that's the area of the oval that's light blue. And then we have the area of the oval that's, light, that's green, the area of the oval that's yellow, and the area of the oval that's dark blue. And so we calculate all those pieces of the oval that are in this partition, A1 up through A5, and we add those together. And that should be the same as the area of the oval, the oval on its own. All right, so hopefully this graphical representation through the Venn diagram gets to the idea of what's going on in the total law of probability. Now, the second step in this total law is that we can calculate this intersection of B and each of the events in the partition by using our definition for conditional probability. That is, the probability of B and A1 is equal to the probability of B given A1 times the probability of A1. And then we can do the same thing for the partition or the uh, event A2, we calculate the probability of B given A2 times the probability of A2, and so forth. And so this total law of probability is what we're going to commonly use to calculate the denominator in Bayes' rule. If we go back to our die rolling examples, and we're calculating the same probability, oh sorry, we're calculating the probability here just being less than 3, so no conditional probability anymore, but if you remember that that was the probability of B, that was the denominator in our example of Bayes' rule. And so here we're just showing different ways of calculating that denominator. So first off, the event is just rolling a 1 or a 2. Those are the possibilities that are less than 3. And then uh, we can calculate, we can construct a partition really any way we want. So here's one example partition. We have the singleton events. That is, you roll the 1, you roll the 2, you roll the 3, you roll the 4, or 5, or 6. All right? so those six events can uh, are... are our partition of the sample space S. And now we're going to calculate the probability of B, and we're going to do so by using the total law of probability with this partition A1 up through A6. So here we have probability of A B given A1 times the probability of A1, plus the probability of B given A2 times the probability of A2, and so forth for each event in that partition. Now, what's the probability of B given A1? That is, what's the probability that the roll is a 1 or a 2, given that we know that the roll was a 1? Well, that's just 1. And what's the probability of A1? Well, that's 1 sixth. So that first term in the sum is just 1 times 1 sixth. The second term in the sum is also 1 times 1 sixth. But then all the other terms are 0 times 1 sixth. All right, so those are the first two terms, and then the rest of them are all 0 times 1 sixth. Because this says, what's the probability of rolling a 1 or a 2 if you knew you roll a 3? Well, that's 0. All right, so that's where those zeros come from. And if we add these up, we get 1 6 plus 1 6, that's 2 6, that's 1 3rd. Exactly the same denominator that we had before when we were using it in Bayes' rule. Now, we didn't have to use this partition. We could have used any partition we wanted to. So here's another partition. Here we have the odds, and we have the evens. So the 1 3 5 and the 2 4 6. Now, we could be writing these out as A1 and A2, but when you have a set and its complement that form the partition, it's more common to write the set as one uh, letter, in this case A, and then we have its complement, A complement. All right, we're still trying to calculate the probability of B, but now we can use the total law of probability on these, this partition, A and A complement, and that's what the total law of probability looks like when we use the partition. Now we can calculate, well, maybe I should go back, we can calculate what's the probability of B given A? So that is, if we know the rules of 1, 3, or 5, what's the probability it's a 1 or a 2? We already talked about this before, right? That probability is one third. Now, what's the probability of A? Well, the probability of A is just one half because the odds are half of the possible rolls. And then the same thing happens for probability of B given A complement and probability of A complement. So you get one third times one half plus one third times one half. If you calculate that, you again get one third. So 
multiple ways of collecting at the denominator in Bayes' rule. And in practice, what you want to do is you want to find a partition that makes it easy to calculate these probabilities. All right, now let's get on to a uh, more applicable example. This example here is an example that probably every one of us in our lives will have a reason to be interested in. So this example is about diagnostic screening tests. So this is a test where you go to the doctor and they don't necessarily think that you have anything particularly wrong with you, uh, but they're gonna run a set of tests just to see if they find anything. Okay, so that's what it means to be a screening test. And in particular, you went to the doctor and you got the result back that it was positive. That whatever test was positive, and in the medical parlance, this is a bad thing, right? Positive means that it's more likely that you have the disease. Okay, so you tested positive. Uh, most likely you're freaking out, right? But now if you could sit back and say, all right, what's the probability that I have the disease given that I tested positive? Uh, in order to calculate this, we're going to need a few different events. So here's going to be our notation for events, and I'm straying here from the notation I've used before when I've used letters, uh, because I think the notation will be a little bit more intuitive. So a plus is just going to be that the test tested positive. And the opposite of that is a minus. So that means that the test was negative. Uh, just as a reminder, because these are the only two possibilities, this minus or this negative is really the complement of the plus. And that's why I've written the plus complement there. All right, then we have two other events. We have D means that the individual has a disease and D complement is that the patient or individual does not have the disease. All right, so it turns out that with diagnostic screening tests, we typically know two quantities. We know the sensitivity. So the sensitivity is the probability of testing positive if you have the disease. And we know the specificity, that is testing negative if you don't have the disease. And we typically know these because the tests have been run lots of times uh, where we eventually know the result of whether or not the person has the disease and we can go back and calculate the proportion of individuals who tested positive have the disease and the proportion of individuals who test negative who don't have the disease. In order to do the calculation we need for Bayes' rule, we need one more term. We need something called the prevalence. This is just the, uh, how common the disease is in the population. And that's just denoted here, the probability of the disease. Now, in order to construct these slides, I uh, did a little Google searching and I tried to figure out one test where I could actually uh, use real world estimated sensitivities and specificities and prevalence. And the first one that I found uh, that I could use is this uh, example, uh, digital mammography for breast cancer. There is a link right up here to the paper where I found the sensitivity and specificity and prevalence for this disease. So here they are, sensitivity for the particular test that they were talking about was 0.97. The specificity was 0.645. That's a little bit lower than most screening tests. And uh, prevalence was one eighth in the population that's being tested, uh, and that's 0.125. All right, so now you've gone to the doctor and you've had a, a mammogram, a digital mammogram in this case, and it came back, said positive for breast cancer. And again, most of us freak out, okay? Uh, but here we're going to calculate the probability that we have the disease given that you just tested positive. And now the most knee-jerk reaction or the common reaction that folks have is to say, well, if the probability of testing positive, if I have the disease is 0.97, then probably the probability of having the disease if I've tested positive is also 0.97. And that thinking does not work because what you just did in your mind is you flip the conditioning bar. And in particular, the probability that you have the disease given that you tested positive is this probability right here, probability of D given plus. And we see that the sensitivity over here is the probability of plus given D, right? And what you just did in your mind there is equate those two probabilities and you can't do that. Okay, so what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna use Bayes' rule. So the probability of testing, the probability that you have the disease given that you tested positive is the probability of testing positive if you have the disease times the probability of having the disease divided by the probability of testing positive. Well, you'll see nowhere up here do we have that probability in the denominator. Right? We do not know this overall probability of testing positive. And so we're going to use the total law of probability to expand that denominator. And the partition that we're going to use is having the disease and not having the disease. And when you do so, it looks like this. The denominator becomes the probability of testing positive if you have the disease times the probability of the disease plus the probability of testing positive if you don't have the disease times the probability of not having the disease. Okay. Well, we still don't have all the terms in that expression. 
right? In particular, these terms on the denominator on the right side, uh, we don't know what those are. But now, note that there's only two possibilities for testing positive, or for the results of the test. Either you test positive, or you test negative. And the probability of testing negative is just one minus the probability of testing positive. And so the first term there, we can just write as one minus the probability of testing negative if you don't have the disease. And now the same thing is true for having the disease or not having the disease. There's only two possibilities. So the probability of not having the disease is just one minus the probability of having the disease. And so if we write that in, uh, we can rewrite the same expression now here. And now we know all these terms, right? All these terms are the sensitivity, specificity, or prevalence. If we plug in the numbers that we have up above, those are the numbers. And now we can calculate the probability of having the disease if you test positive, and it turns out that it's about 0.28. So still not very high. So you've gone to the doctor, you've had the screening test, and it's positive, but it's actually still more likely that you don't have the disease than that you do. And now, I don't wanna say don't get any screening tests. Like that's not the point here, but the point here is to take the results of a screening test with a grain of salt, right? With an understanding that the sensitivity, specificity, and prevalence play a role in the probability of having the disease uh, given that you tested positive. And so, right, you might wanna talk with your doctor about, hey, what is the sensitivity and specificity and prevalence? So that's for the test, and what is the prevalence of the disease that we're testing for? So that you can do this calculation on your own. Uh, one other thing to think about is maybe you went to the doctor and you tested negative, right? Is that meaningful? Is that helpful? So here we can do the same calculation, but testing negative, and you can do this and test it uh, for yourself, and we find out that that probably having the disease, if you test negative, is about 0.01 or about one in 100. And so the key piece here is that these screening tests are typically much more useful for telling you that you don't have something than for telling you that you do have something. Which is why if the screening tests come back positive, uh, your doctor will likely tell you to go on for further testing, right? And we're gonna see if in fact you do have the disease or not. All right, so as a summary, today we introduced Bayes' rule, which is just a double application of the definition for conditional independence. We expanded the denominator using the total law of probability, and we applied this Bayes' rule to diagnostic screening tests. Next time, we're going to be introducing the idea of statistical independence. Until then, I hope you have a great one.